Welcome to part 3 of 3 of this demo video series on Live Volume with Auto Failover Support for Microsoft. Now that we have covered Live Volume features, functionality, and failure scenarios, let's take a look at a lab environment where we will show a demonstration of Live Volume with Auto Failover for Microsoft. As we start the live demo, the first thing we will do is review the layout of the environment. Using the Dell Storage Manager client, we can see the presence of our two storage centers, SC31, which hosts the primary live volumes, and SC32, which hosts the secondary live volumes. By clicking on the Replications and Live Volumes workspace, and then the Live Volumes tab, we can see a list of the live volumes shown here. In this example, all are primary on SC31, and secondary on SC32. The status of all the volumes is healthy, fully synchronized, and as we scroll over to the right, we can verify that all of the volumes are configured to fail over automatically, and that this particular instance of Dell Storage Manager is acting as the local tiebreaker for all of these volumes. And finally, we can verify that all of the live volumes are in a protected state, meaning they will support automatic failover given a DR scenario. On these two storage centers, we have configured two separate physical host clusters that are using local boot disks and are configured to use uniform server mappings to both storage centers for access to the live volumes. By viewing the VMware vSphere web client, we can view the VMware cluster here with its two Windows guests, 6A and 6B. These two guest VMs are configured as a cluster that is using physical raw device mappings or PRDMs for its cluster disks. These physical raw device mappings are configured as live volumes shown here in the DSM client as ESX file 1, file 2, and quorum. The second physical host cluster is running Windows Server 2012 R2 Hyper-V. Failover Cluster Manager shows the presence of the two nodes TSSRV 221 and 222, and there are four guest VMs running here. Guest 7A and 7B form a two-node guest VM cluster using shared VHDs for its cluster and quorum disks. Those shared VHDs reside on a cluster shared volume named CSV1 on the physical cluster that is also a live volume. In the DSM client, the CSV that is hosting the shared VHDs is shown here. Returning to TSSRV221, we can see the second Windows guest cluster consisting of two VM nodes, guest 9A and 9B. This guest cluster is using direct attached in guest iSCSI disks for cluster and quorum disks. Because the iSCSI disks are mapped directly to the guests, they are not displayed in Failover Cluster Manager. But if we look in the DSM client, those iSCSI volumes are listed here as live volumes and we can identify them by the intuitive naming used when they were created. On each of these three guest VM clusters, we have configured one or more Windows file server roles with an associated file share to allow us to initiate a large file copy to these file shares as our workload as we perform failure test. The file share roles can be seen here, starting with guest 6A, running on VMware with PRDMs, guest 7A, running on Hyper-V using shared VHDs, and guest 9A also running on Hyper-V using in-guest iSCSI disks. Before initiating a failure of the primary storage controller with the primary live volumes, let's start Iometer with a cluster disk that is a live volume set as the target disk. With Iometer running, we will use a stopwatch a little later on in the demo to record how long it takes for I.O. to resume as the primary live volumes fill over to the second storage center, SC32. Next, we'll initiate a file copy operation to a file share on each of the three guest node clusters. In this way, we will be able to verify that the file copy operation continues uninterrupted as the live volumes fail over. For our file copy operation, we'll copy a large VHD file. With Iometer running and a large file copy operation in process, we'll return to the DSM client and refresh the view to verify that all of our live volumes are still 100% in sync and that they are all still in a protected state before we fail the primary storage center, SC31. 
Next, we will fail the primary storage center to simulate a disaster that takes the primary live volume offline unexpectedly. We will do this by taking remote control of each of the two controller heads in SC31 and performing a power reset. Since SC31 has two controller heads, we'll need to power off both at the same time to cause a complete, ungraceful, unexpected storage center outage. We will do this now by clicking on the Perform Action button for each controller head. Let's go now to our three guest VM clusters and start the stopwatch on guest 6A, 7A, and 9A. Note how I.O. has temporarily paused due to the primary live volumes going offline, and in the background, the DSM tiebreaker promotes the secondary live volumes on SE32 to primary. And we can see that I.O. resumed on guest 6A, running on VMware, in a little over 20 seconds. We'll now monitor the other two guests until I.O. resumes there. Note that it may take a little longer for the VMs running on Hyper-V to resume I.O. even though the live volumes are now available, as it can take a little longer for Windows hosts to retry the data paths. I.O. resumes on guests 7A and 9A running on Hyper-V in a little less than one minute. If we take a look at the DSM client, we see a lot of red indicating that all of the live volumes are in a failed over state and that SC31 is offline. Despite this, note that the secondary live volumes all show with a status of up. If we take a look at our file copy operations, we see that they have all continued uninterrupted without any errors or timeouts occurring. We'll now wait a few minutes to allow the primary storage center, SC31, to recover from the ungraceful power resets and come back online. Now that Storage Center 31 is back online, let's reconnect to it by using the DSM client and take a look at our live volumes. With Restore automatically checked, the live volumes are all going to attempt to repair themselves, with the primary live volumes now showing on SC32 and the secondary live volumes now showing on SC31. Once replication is fully caught up, which will take a few moments because we had a file copy operation in process during the failure, we can then manually swap the live volume roles and move the primary live volumes back to SC31 again. Now that all of the live volume pairs have fully recovered and show with a state of protected, we can now perform a live volume roll swap to move the primary live volumes back to the primary storage center again. To do this, We'll use the shift key to select all of the live volumes, right click, and choose Swap Primary Storage Center Live Volume. We'll allow a few minutes for this to complete, clicking on Refresh until all of the live volumes show as primary on SC31 with a status of Protected again. And finally, through this entire simulated DR event, the file copy operation workload continued and completed without any errors or interruptions. That concludes part three of this demo video series. For more information on Dell Storage, please visit our documentation and video library at Dell Tech Center. Thanks for watching.